Next up is a fun example that involves a little bit of solid body mechanics that you can really play with and see. This is going to lead us to a very cool theorem that involves equilibria, periodic orbits, other stuff like that. Here's the setup. Take an object and throw it up in the air, spinning it, rotating it about some axis. What happens? Well, it falls to the ground because there's gravity. But let's assume there wasn't any gravity and you just, you just took this thing and were able to spin it. So for example, a tennis racket works really well because you can take that thing, it's lightweight, you can spin it really fast about an axis and it, it just remains rotating about that axis. And that works for more than one axis where you can spin it and it, it seems to just keep doing its thing, spinning about that axis. There's something odd though, when you spin it about a middle axis, the intermediate axis, where it seems like it's spinning about that axis and then it does something a little unusual. Okay, here's the assumptions we're gonna work under. You've got a solid body in 3D. You have principal axes of rotation. These are gonna to correspond to the X, Y, and Z axis respectively. There are gonna be three principal moments of inertia. I1, I2, I3. We're going to assume that they are in descending order. So I1 is the biggest, then I2, then I3. These are sometimes called IXX, IYY, and IZZ. You may need to recall your moments of inertia, think back, remember, maybe you learned a little bit of solid body mechanics along the way. There is some cool stuff in that subject. Okay, so that's my setup. I've got my solid body, which I could think of as a block if I wanted to. Now, if you rotate this about any axis through the origin, there are going to be three components to its angular momentum. M1, M2, and M3. And as it's spinning, these angular momenta are going to evolve over time, continuous time. How does that happen? That happens according to the Euler equations of motion. Here they go. The derivative of m1 with respect to t is i2 minus i3 divided by i2 times i3 times m2 times m3. Remember those i's, those are the principal moments of inertia. dm2 dt is given by i3 minus i1 over i1 times i3 times m1 times m3. And the derivative of m3 with respect to time is i1 minus i2 divided by i1 times i2 times m1 times m2. You can see there's a lot of symmetry in there. We're not going to derive these equations. They come from solid body mechanics. Now, what are we going to do? What we always do. Let's look for the equilibria. Oh my, there are so many of them. I could have m1 equal to 0, or m2 equal to 0, or m3 equal to 0 in pairwise combinations, and I'm going to get equilibria. You have equilibria along the entire x-axis, the entire y-axis, and the entire z-axis. Now, this isn't that weird. It kind of makes sense, because these are the principal axes of rotation. If you start rotating about the x, or the y, or the z-axis, you remain rotating about that axis with that pure angular momentum just along one direction. Now here's another fact that's going to be crucial to us. This is a conservative system. There's no gravity. There's no friction. The quantity phi given by m1 squared plus m2 squared plus m3 squared is constant. This does not change over time. That means if we fix a value of phi then that is an invariant surface. In this case, if we say phi is equal to c squared, a strictly positive quantity, then what we get as the level set of phi is a round sphere centered at the origin radius c. Because the equilibria lie along the x, y, and z axes, when we restrict to this surface, this sphere, we are pierced by those axes 6 times. We have six equilibria on this sphere. They are at plus or minus c, 0, 0, 0, plus or minus c, 0, and 0, 0, plus or minus c. And what these correspond to is rotating 
along the principal axes, either in a clockwise or a counterclockwise direction. And now we can do what we want to do. Or rather, we can do what we're supposed to do. That is, take the derivative. We might not want to do this so much because it's a little bit complicated. I'm going to leave it to you to do that differentiation on a piece of scratch paper. I've given you the hopefully correct answer here. And now we work one equilibrium at a time. Let's take the first one, C, 0, 0. If I evaluate the derivative there, I thankfully get a lot of zeros. In fact, I only have two non-zero terms. And if I investigate those carefully, knowing that c is positive, I'm going to look at those i coefficients out in front. And one of them is going to be positive because i1 is bigger than i2. But the other one is going to be negative because i1 is bigger than i3. That means i3 minus i1 is a negative quantity. Aha, now this is very interesting. We could compute the eigenvalues at this point, but we really don't need to. This has a block diagonal structure. So clearly, one of those eigenvalues is equal to zero. And of course, that makes sense. Why? Because we have a line of equilibria. So along the x-axis, the eigenvector for this zero eigenvalue, you have a line of equilibria. Of course, you're going to have a zero eigenvalue there. But the plane that is perpendicular to this, parallel to the yz plane, that has locally planar dynamics that is governed by that second block, that 2 by 2 block. And in that 2 by 2 block, what do we see? Well, we've got trace zero, determinant positive. That means we have a center in this two-dimensional plane. Now, can we trust that? Oh, yes, because these are conservative dynamics. No friction, no gravity. It really is going to be a center. Now, with more work, we can show that at plus or minus c, 0, 0, we get centers, no problem. At 0, plus or minus c, 0, that is rotating about the y-axis, we have saddles in that complementary direction. But at 0, 0, plus or minus c, rotating about the z-axis, we again get centers. Now, what this means physically is that you're wobbling if you're rotating about the x or the z-axis and you perturb it a little bit. It just wobbles. But if you're rotating about the y-axis, this intermediate axis, then weird things happen. If you perturb away from that equilibrium, it's not stable. It's not even weakly stable. This, plus a little bit of what we know about the conservative nature of the dynamics, explains some really interesting behavior. If I take a look at an example of this block rotated about the different axes, x, y, and z, from bottom to top, and if I look at the pure rotation on the left, and then as I'm moving to the right, I've just slightly perturbed the initial condition a little bit. So it's not, it's not quite level. Then what we see is that rotation about the x-axis or the z-axis is sort of weakly stable. You just wobble a little bit. But about that intermediate axis, ooh, there's some unusual flipping that happens. The full 3D picture of what is happening is really interesting. When you put all of these local pieces together, you can see how when restricted to this sphere where the net energy is constant, then you get this pair of centers for the x-axis and for the z-axis, but then you get this pair of saddles for the y-axis, that intermediate axis. And what is happening is you could see those wobbles in a neighborhood of a center, but in a neighborhood of a saddle, you are ejected and you flip all the way over to the other side. This is a very good example of how understanding the local picture of dynamics and putting it together gives you a global understanding of what is going on in an interesting physical system. You can really see what's happening.